just for those of you who are new to sysadmin, uh, web work on the server needs two things running in order for it to run. It needs Apache and it needs your database, which is either MySQL or MariaDB, depending on how recent your uh, Linux is. Uh, MySQL being older, MariaDB being newer. So um, a couple of commands here. Checking the status of HTTP to see if it's running. Uh, so if I go to my server here, and again, you'll have to do this as root, so you'll either need to sudo or be logged in as root. You can do service HTTPD status. That's pretty standard. Again, because uh, in the newest versions of Linux, they're actually switching to the system control. But it's uh, alias to the old command that I'm using. So this is the thing I've highlighted is the newer thing, but it's only on very new systems. Uh, anything previous to that will typically use this. Um, so it tells me that it's active and running. And then it gives me a bunch more information, uh, including the web work stuff that uh, that it spits out when you start Apache. Um, a couple of things. If, if you can't contact your web server at all, uh, then typically this status might tell you that it's not running. But if it does tell you that it's running, then you're going to want to stop it and restart it. So your typical commands here are stop, start, status, restart. And then the one I've got on my slide, which is actually good if your server is uh, in production, if you've got courses running right at the moment, is service HTTPD graceful. And again, that technology might change, or that terminology might change. In the Red Hat world, it's typically HTTPD. It might be Apache. It might be Apache 2. It might just be HTTP. Uh, this you're going to have to check on whatever server you're using. Uh, the benefit of Graceful is that what Graceful does is it waits till each Apache child has finished sending out the page that it's sending, and then it kills them and restarts them. So if a student was in the middle of submitting a question and you stop the server, then you're possibly left in some weird state where you don't know if that submission got recorded and the student didn't necessarily get an answer back. If you do Graceful, then all your Apache children should uh, be killed. It always sounds weird to be killing your children. But anyways, all the Apache processes should be killed. Um, it just waits until they're done what they're doing. They don't start a new request, but whatever request they're on gets finished before it kills them. Uh, the one thing to be uh, careful, uh, wary of with Graceful is that it sometimes it isn't good at cleaning up runaway or locked processes. So if an Apache process is stuck on something and is completely locked up, then Graceful sometimes won't actually kill it, and that doesn't allow the server to fully restart. So in that case, you may have to do a service HTTPD stop, wait till everything is completely stopped, and then service HTTPD start. Um, the other one that's always got to be running is MySQL or MariaDB. Uh, so again, this is a CentOS 7 system that I'm working on here. So I believe it's called MariaDB. So I can do service MariaDB status. And again, it says it's running. So that means the database should be listening. It should be accepting connections. And it should be uh, sending back data when WebWork requests it. It should be writing data when WebWork sends it. So my database server is running. Uh, and just some quick troubleshooting. I'm going to stop the database server. So the database server means that the web server is still running. I haven't actually turned off the web server. So if I go to the web server front page, it still sends me the welcome to your server page. So this is the CentOS page. And if I go to slash web work 2, it still loads this page because it hasn't had to do anything with the database yet. But as soon as I click on a course, you get this error. If you see this error, error instantiating database driver, blah, 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 DBI connect, then, uh, well, I mean, you see DB and DBI, it's a database problem. And that database problem is often one of two things. It's either because your database isn't running or uh, 
the permissions to connect to the database aren't set right. So either it has the wrong password or it doesn't have permission to read the database. So right now I know exactly what the problem is because I just killed the database. So it's that the database isn't running. But the first thing you should check now is, is your database running? Right? And I do a service MariaDB or MySQL or MySQLD, whatever it happens to be on your system status, then uh, it says that it's dead or inactive. So the first thing I should try then is to start it. Right? And if it doesn't tell me it didn't start, then I can hopefully believe that it started, but I can always check with status. And it's running. So now if I reload this page, it waits impatiently, and it should load the page as normal. And again, because I was logged in before, it hasn't killed my session. Uh, so I'm logged in. And the nice thing about web work is that everything is stored to the database right away. So even if you stop your server, uh, if you start it back up, it will pick up exactly where it left off. Anyone who clicks a link, if the server is back up, it'll work again. If the server's down, it obviously can't do anything, but the second it comes back up, it should work again. Um, again, same thing with Apache. You may need to restart it. Um, if you're having to restart it regularly, then it's probably related to something else I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but that's the very basics of starting and stopping the two things on the server that you need. Um, there's a lot of things I have in these slides that I'm not going to go into detail on because they're more geared to the sysadmin person, uh, the actual Linux administrator at your university than they are to the web work administrator. But they're things that you should have the conversation about with your system administrator. Uh, if it's you, then you're going to have to Google some of the things that I'm talking about here because I can't, I don't have the time to go into all the details. Uh, this is something that uh, I can't remember if I learned the hard way, but I've seen happen way too many times. And that is uh, there's a power outage in wherever your server lives, and uh, the power comes back on. Most servers will turn themselves back on, but you have to make sure that your server is set to start Apache and start MySQL or MariaDB at boot time. So there's a command called check config. Uh, for sure on Red Hat, I think it's also on on the uh, uh, Debian side. But that will allow you to check if these servers are set to run on boot, and if not, it will allow you to turn them on on boot. So these are things that you should ask your sysadmin, or if you are the actual Linux sysadmin, then you should look into making sure this happens, because uh, none of us want to be the one that gets the call at 8 PM saying, the web work server is down. The more you can trust it to fix itself, the less you have to worry about things like this. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, even on the newest version of Fedora's, I think they've moved away from check config. There might be, there's a different way of loading things into uh, services. Uh, Jeff or Jason might be better to answer those. So another thing you should, uh, and this came up on the forums earlier this week, you should talk to your IT group about is that if if your web work server is going to be accessible from the world, then students need to be able to connect to it on either port 80 if you're not using HTTPS or port 443 if you've set up secure HTTP. Um, so those connections need to be allowed in on whatever firewalls there are between the world and your campus and also on the local firewall on your uh, server. So again, most of the servers that we've installed this week or we've helped you with this week, it's going to be uh, IP tables as the default firewall system. So if you check IP tables to see if it's allowing connections on port 80 or port 443. Um, for you to manage your system, you need uh, access to SSH. That's how most of you are connecting to your server. Uh, it's it's a, a little bit of a uh, risk is maybe too strong a word, but a lot of systems don't like opening SSH to the whole world because it opens them up to uh, brute force attacks, people just trying to guess passwords because they know that almost all servers are open on port 22. So more and more campuses are moving to only allowing connections on SSH from either on campus or if your campus has a virtual private network, a VPN, that allows you to get on campus, 
then uh, it's only networks that they're aware of. It's not anyone on the internet can try and connect to your server and log in and make changes. Uh, WebWork doesn't need a lot of outgoing connections. Uh, most servers by default allow all outgoing connections because anything that's outgoing, you've started from within the server. So you don't have to worry too much about that unless your, uh, your IT people say they're not allowing all outgoing connections. Then typically the things that WebWork needs that we're aware of are uh, HTTPS in order to do Git possibly HTTP, depending on which system you're using for doing uh, yum updates or apt get updates, things like that. And uh, if you need send mail, then you need to, if you need to send mail from your server, then you have to set up the SMTP connections to allow them going out to whatever your SMTP server is. So these are conversations to have with your IT people to say, you know, secure your server properly. Um, some log files, and again, these have been hinted at before, but now that you've all got your own servers, you should be able to look at these various log files. Um, so, just jump back there for a second. The most common ones you're gonna need are the Apache logs. Access log and error log are exactly what you would expect. Access log is anyone who has accessed a page on your web server. It keeps a log of that. Error log is any time errors are logged. So um, again, on most Linux systems, these live somewhere in slash bar slash log. Uh, depending on what type of system you use, where they are within there could be different. On my uh, Red Hat or CentOS based system, it's typically in the HTTPD subdirectory. Uh, I believe for Ubuntu it's Apache 2, but again, uh, Jason or Jeff can probably fill you in on that for sure. So there's a directory somewhere in bar log that has these files in it, and again, because this server's only been running for one day, there is just access log and error log. We'll talk about log rotate in a minute to manage these logs. So I can look at either of these files. Uh, you notice even with my server only having run since last night, this log is already pretty long because every page request gets logged here. Um, there's some interesting information here. It tells you uh, what IP address asked for the, the page, when that page was served, and also if it can tell what the, what the uh, actual page you sent out was, uh, whether that page was sent out successfully. Uh, if you know your HTTP codes, 304 means that it was an actual successful web request, uh, where they came from, so what page they were on previously, and if it can determine it, uh, what browser and what operating system they were using. So again, this is more to see if uh, students actually were clicking around the system when they said they were. There's not a lot of times that you need to look at this, but it is there to see if your web server is serving a page as you think it is and how many pages it's serving. Uh, the one that's often good for troubleshooting is the other one in this directory, which is the error log. This is all the errors that WebWork has generated. A lot of these are benign. They don't actually tell you anything. We've been asked about this particular one uh, at least a dozen times this week. Uh, all this means is that the web server doesn't know a actual name for it, right? I'm just connecting to this as localhost. It doesn't have some name like my webwork.myserver.edu, um, and or it, it can't determine that. You can fix this by setting server name in your Apache configuration, but these errors won't hurt you. Um, what's more interesting to us and is things like this. Um, again. We didn't see anything in WebWork die, so this is probably not a real error. In fact, the fact that it says better written as means, uh, again, it's just a notation thing. But this is also a bit of a red flag for the developers because in the next version of Perl, this may be an issue where when it says this is better written as this, they may no longer accept the previous notation. So these are things we have to watch out for. Uh, again, Here's the type of error that we see when we're actually doing things and we get errors in web work. Uh, Mike showed you some of this 
when he was uh, troubleshooting the library browser. And this is, again, a place where this is going to happen. Here's something interesting to us, which we'll come back to in a few minutes, is max request workers, which we've already talked about, meaning all of the, uh, all of the Apache processes were serving pages at the same time. Uh, it says, consider raising the max request workers, which, again, we've talked about. The more of these you have, the more pages you can, uh, you can send out simultaneously, but the more memory eats up. And if you run out of memory, it basically grinds your server to a halt. So the fact that I'm doing this means that people are having to wait for requests when they do this. Which, again, when we say wait, it could be you know a tenth of a second, because if they're serving simple pages, they may be able to do it in a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second. Uh, you notice that when I was using my server, if I click on this page, it loads real fast. I click on this page, it loads real fast. So, you know, it might be able to do 10 of those in a second for each of my web work processes on the server. Um, so the fact that they all ran out isn't necessarily a fatal thing because this guy finishes my request in a tenth of a second and it can move on to the next student. So uh, that is your Apache logs. Those are system logs. Those aren't specific to web work. They are for the whole web server. So if you have other things running on the same web server, it's those errors and those page requests will also show up in those same logs. Then there's the logs that are specific to web work. So there's a couple of places to look for these. Uh, web work, web work two. So for the ones that are for the entire web work system, they're in opt web work, web work two logs, unless you move those, which again, you can do in your config files, like we looked at earlier. Um, two files here, hostedcourses.log, which again, has exactly the one course that I've created on this server. This file, again, unless, even if you get a thousand courses on your server, the file is going to be a thousand lines long. It's never going to hurt you. Uh, timing log, on the other hand, for every web work request, it tells me how long it is. And it holds true to what I said, right? These simple pages are loading in 0 0.035 seconds, whereas when I look at a homework set or a homework problem, it's taking 0.3 seconds because here, it's basically, uh, it has to ask the database a couple of things, but it's basically just printing a page. Whereas here, it has to read that question file, parse that question file, send out all the information uh, with the JavaScript and stuff to students. So if you're running a homework problem, you go, you'll notice almost a tenfold factor increase in the amount of time it takes to process. Uh, which relates to the next thing I'm getting to, which is the library browser. When you load 20 questions, multiply that by 20, uh, give or take. And you're looking at uh, a lot more burden on your server. So again, if you're not interested in this information, you may just want to turn this, uh, this log off. You can comment out that line in, uh, or you can put nowhere for the location of the timing log, uh, that is leave it blank in your uh, configuration file, then it will write this every time. Uh, if you are interested in how long these page requests are taking, then you want to keep this around, but we'll get into log rotate in a second, which allows you to, to actually uh, back these up and delete them after a certain amount of time. Uh, in terms of savings for turning off the timing log, it's, it's not huge, it's just, more a matter of, yeah, the file itself gets large, and it's one less thing you have to worry about uh, eating up all your disk space if you turn it off, especially if you're not using it. But yes, if you set up a log rotate, you'll be fine with that. Um, so this is the web work global logs for the entire web work system, and then each course has its own set of logs. So if I go into courses, uh, you'll see all your courses here. The only real course I have is my test course. In there, there's a, so opt web work courses, each individual course, there's a directory called logs. And what we have in here, typically, uh, I don't know if I've answered any questions yet. So I don't know, does it still even write to the answer log? I can't remember.
So yes. So now that I've answered the question, it's created this answer log. Um, this is the first question that's ever been submitted in this course, which is why the answer log didn't exist. So if I look at that answer log, right now it's going to be very short. Right? It tells me the user, the name of the homework set, which question it was. I forget what that is. Is that my status on the question? I think that's my grade. Um, I believe that's a timestamp, and then the answer I typed. Uh, this has mostly been deprecated. I think this is just uh, legacy at this point because it is, uh, it's also writing these to the database, which is what actually goes and looks them up. The database has more information, and it also it's much easier to find old answers for the system in the database because they're indexed and things like that than it is for it, the system to have to uh, comb through a text file. But if you want a simple way to look at these, then you can, uh, you can do this here. This, a simple way to look at these for the whole uh, course, uh, just write the past answers page for an individual student is much more efficient if you just want to see what someone entered. Um, but the nice thing about this is that uh, in one sense it's nice that it doesn't parse these answers. It just writes, it just writes to this file whatever the students typed in. So if web work misinterprets something, you can look at the raw text of these things. This is something that, again, um, in the past few years of administering web work, I've never had to look at this answer log. Because almost everything you want to do, you can do through the, uh, the web interface through the past answers table. Uh, what's more interesting to me is the login log. And this is something I have looked at because a student says, I did my whole assignment and it didn't record it. And you go back and you say, OK, well, I can check when the last time you logged in was. The assignment was due on Friday, and you didn't log in any time between Tuesday and Friday. You logged in Saturday at 4 in the morning. Uh, it will tell you the exact time of their login. The other thing this is useful for is it will tell you uh, both successful and failed logins. Right? So it tells me that I had an OK login uh, at 6.30 this morning which again, uh, it's because my system has the wrong time zone on it. Uh, a couple of OK logins. Uh, it also tells you an inactivity timeout. So this is where I had uh, clicked on a screen after my session had timed, up, timed out. So uh, it had login failed. But it'll also tell you if people are using the wrong username and password. So for example, if I log out of my course, and I try logging in as Danny, I get an error. Um, the other thing that you may want to get uh, familiar with if you're going to be looking at these logs is the tail command. The tail command gives you just the last few lines of the file rather than the whole file. Uh, this one's not big, but it's handy uh, for larger files. And uh, tail-f is also an interesting one because it keeps the file open and it shows you any new entries that are added. So. Um, these messages are generally quite descriptive, right? User unknown. So it told me that the problem here was I typed in a username that doesn't make sense. It would give me a different message here if it was an unknown, uh, if the password was wrong, but the user was okay. And again, there's other possible errors like you're not allowed to log in because you've dropped the course or because you don't have enough permission, things like that. Most of those are logged to this login file. Um, if a student emails you and says, I can't log in my course, then you can look here, see what it tells you about why they can't log in. Those are sort of the key log files that you'll typically have to look through. Um, the login.log file, again, it, it, it only gets as big as there are login attempts on that particular course. So if you have a thousand students and the course is running for a full year, you may want to start uh, culling that log. If not, you can let it be. The one that you do want to manage is these access log and error logs. Um, the good news is, is that nowadays, most Linux systems will already do that for you. Um, if not, it's easy to set up. Uh, you're going to use a tool called Log Rotate. And I believe that's the same on both the, uh, the Debian family and the Red Hat family. Uh, you configure all of this in etc slash logrotate.d. So 
In here is a list of things it's already uh, rotating. So you'll notice that HTTPD is already something that's handled by log rotate. So even out of the box, our system is already set up to rotate these Apache logs. So let's take a look at that HTTPD file. And again, this is something that I'll leave you to discuss with your system administrators or look online for uh, the syntax when using uh, log rotate. You start by saying which logs you want to rotate. So this is going to rotate every log in the uh, bar log HTTP directory that ends with LOG. That star is a wild card there. So this will catch error log and access log. So um, again, you can look up all these syntax things. Missing OK means don't worry if it's not there. You don't have to create it. Uh, don't bother you know, rotating it if it's empty. Some other things, I'm not sure what the shared scripts does. Delay compress means zip it, but I think only after a certain amount of time because uh, the system may need to do it. And then because Apache needs to uh, let go of these logs, once you're done rotating, get it to reload Apache so that it's not trying to write to that log you just moved. Um, you can also set time frames on here. You can say things like daily, weekly. You can say things like keep seven. So uh, for our Apache logs, we typically keep them for the length of the semester. So because Apache does a lot of logging, you may want to rotate it daily, but you may want to keep uh, the last 30 for a month or 60 or 120 however long you think you're going to need to go back and look at these. Once it's beyond the point where you're going to need that information, then you don't need to worry about uh, keeping them beyond that. So the nice thing about log rotate is it will make, it will take the current file, it will back it up to somewhere, give it a name, um, you can set it to give it a name with a date and things like that, and you can even tell it that after a certain amount of days, delete them. So you may want to keep them for a week, you may want to keep them for a month. You can do all that with log rotate and then you don't have to worry about it. So um, I was trying to go into my logs just to sort of look at mine on my server, and I could have sworn I could access the Apache, the Ver log, the Apache 2 yesterday, but now I can't. It may depend on how you were logged in. Um, I'm logged in as root here, so var log is typically something that not any user can get to. So you often need to either be root or you need to sudo. Um, because you're going to be going into directories that you don't have access to, what you may want to do is sudo su, which will log you in as the root user. And then you can do everything. Just remember that once you've done that and you've done whatever you uh, need to do to log back out of root, with great power comes great responsibility. I always run into interesting things like this on these systems because there's a lot of things you can look at but not touch if you're not root. So often you can get into these directories, but as soon as you try to do anything real, it stops you. But yeah, I mean, again, typically these are for system, ad system administrators, so they are restricted to just root. Jim, can you expand on your question? Where, where do you want to add it to? What you're, there's a couple of things. One is you should check that the Apache logs are rotating frequently enough for your liking. So because this is only a, uh, this is only a test server for me. Uh, I will, these logs won't ever get big, but you'll notice already that even just with me fooling around with the server for a day, my access log is 224K, I believe. Um, there's the H command to show you in human readable format. So my uh, access log is 220K come back after a week of running your server and see, first of all, if there's, what you'll likely find is because uh, in my system, log rotate is already set up, what you'll likely find is that there will be access log underscore, um, and again, the naming conventions change from system to system, access underscore log underscore one underscore two, or possibly underscore the date um, when it backs them up. And then, uh, if you come back after a month and this directory has, you know, a gigabyte worth of stuff in it, then you have to look at changing these settings so that it deletes them more frequently. Um, 
the one thing you probably do want to do is if you were worried about your uh, timing log getting large, there won't be a default one of these for the timing log, but you can cut and paste one of these other files, right? So you can go into logrotate.d, that directory, you can copy the HTTP one, change this path to the path to the timing log. Back, why don't I see if I can do that right now? Um, etc logrotate.d. So I want to set up logrotate for uh, my timing log in WebWorks. So let's copy the HTTP one because I think those settings are close to, and the name of this file is for your benefit. So I'm going to call it WebWork Timing. Now I'm going to edit that WebWork Timing file. And the first thing I have to do is I have to change it to say, this is the log I want you to edit, which is opt WebWork, WebWork to logs, uh, again, this is why you have multiple SSH windows open at once. So you can uh, do this, and yeah, it's just called timing.log. So now I save this file, and your system is set to run log rotate every probably night. Again, you have to check your system configuration. Now it'll look for this file, and it'll rotate it with these settings. And again, I guess I can get rid of this stuff because I don't need to restart Apache after I've messed with this timing log. So again, if you want to set up your own, then this is what you do. If you want to change these settings, then you'll have to look for a tutorial on uh, on log rotate online to see what settings make sense for you.